esperanza de un cariño adormecido yo sabré reír yo sabré llorar yo sabré entregarte mi cariño negra negra que te quiero cosa negra presuntuosa mira que me estoy muriendo dame vida de tu boca bota que me está pisando los talones de la libertad negra negra que te quiero cosa negra presuntuosa mira que me estoy muriendo dame vida de tu boca bota está pisando los talones de la libertad será tal vez la esperanza de un cariño adormecido Yo sabré llorar, yo sabré entregarte mi cariño. Negra, negra que te quiero, goza, negra presuntuosa, mira, que me estoy muriendo, dame, mira de tu boca, bota, que me está pisando los talones de la luz. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're really excited to be here this evening uh, and to uh, share and celebrate uh, the, 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 the book that we're celebrating today, Finding La Negrita uh, by Natasha Gordo Chipembere. Dr. Natasha Gordo Chipembere and Dr. Pablo Jose Lopez Oros will be speaking and, and beginning our conversation in just a few minutes. My name is Josue Perea. I'm the director of the Afro Latina, Afro Latinoa Forum. The Afro Latinoa Forum is a nonprofit focused on centering Blackness within Latinidad. Uh, we are a, a, a small nonprofit, but that's been around for for now our so 17 year old. Although the 2022 is officially our 15th year, we're we've been around for 17th year, 17 years, and we're excited to continue to uh, advance the visibility, awareness, and centering of blackness within Latinidad. It's one of the missions that drives our work forward. We do that by offering educational events like this, by forging coalitions, by engaging communities. Uh, and by making sure that we organize public events that highlights our, 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 our efforts to center Blackness and to continue to center Blackness within discussions of Latinidad specifically. Our work is guided by a communal perspective. And so we're thankful for all of you for joining us. We know that there's been a lot of anticipation uh, for this event this evening, and we're really excited to get started. So I would like to get started by introducing uh, our very own Pablo Jose Lopez Oro. Um, uh, and, and actually, before we do that, though, I do want to remind you to stay in touch with us on Twitter and Instagram at Afro Latino Forum. 
You can send us an email, info at afrolatinoforum.org or afrolatinoforum at gmail. And you can visit our website, afrolatinoforum.org. Um, uh, actually, you can, it's Afrolatina Forum, Afrolatine Forum, Afrolatine Forum, all of those. Uh, we, we, we have all of those uh, uh, um, URLs. So you can feel free to join us in those. But, it's, it, it, but I'm really excited to just begin this time of conversing with our very own Dr. Pablo Jose, Pablo Jose Lopez Soros, who's going to be the one who's going to introduce uh, Dr. Natasha. Dr. Pablo is an assistant professor in the Department of African Studies at Smith College. His research and teaching interests are on Black Latin America and U.S. Black, Black Latinx social movements, Black feminists and LGBTQ activism and, and, and political mobilizations, and Black queer feminist ethnographies in the Americas. His current manuscript, Indigenous Blackness in the Americas, The Queer Politics of Self-Making Garifuna, New York, it's a transdisciplinary ethno ethnography on how gender and sexuality shapes the ways in which transgenerational Garifuna New Yorkers of Central American descent negotiate, perform, and articulate their multiple subjectivities as Black, Indigenous, and Afro-Latinx. Pablo has been with the forum since 2009, and Pablo is a great thinker, and it is my pleasure to introduce Pablo, who's going to take it from here. Pablo, take it away. Good evening, good evening, buenas noches, welcome. Um, I'm incredibly honored and excited to be in conversation today. I'm thrilled to see so many wonderful, familiar faces and new faces, so welcome. Um, before we get to it, um, I just want to bring Medium Jimenez Roman into the space. Um, Medium, Jiman, Medium Jimenez Roman presente um, in many ways. Um, I want to bring her into the space first, particularly because we very much would not be having this conversation without her public intellectual activism. Um, she was someone who, in all of her beautiful Black Puerto Ricanness, deeply understood the complexities of Blackness in Central America, specifically Central America's Caribbean coasts, plural, always plural. Um, so I'm very grateful to bring her into the space and to bring her spirit as we continue the beautiful work that she left for us to continue on. Um, I am honored to be in conversation with Dr. Natasha Gordon Chibembere, who holds a PhD in English from the University of South Africa. She was born in New York to a Costa Rican mom and a Panamanian dad. So all of the beautiful worlds of Black Central America colliding in one of the meccas of the African diaspora, AKA Brooklyn, New York. She is the founder and host of the Thingo Said, I Am Thirsty annual writing retreats in Costa Rica since January 2015. Um, so for the conversation today, I really want to be able to give us the opportunity to get to know more about this quite literally trailblazing book, uh, Finding La Negrita. I'm excited to hear about so many different things, but let's, let's go ahead and center it on a few things first. Um, so I'm excited about the book for a number of reasons. It really disrupts um, particular narratives around um, Black history in Central America, it really also sheds light on the often silenced and erased histories of enslavement in, in, in Costa Rica in particular, um, but as well as Central America, Finally La Negrita is in many ways a captivating retelling of the Black Madonna. Uh, narrative, which was driven, which has driven Costa Rica's national and spiritual identity since the 1700s. Um, and what Natasha really does here, Davila, really gives us an, an intimate and interior portrayal, right, of particularly of slavery within the national imaginary, but the stories, right? So thinking about fugitivity, thinking about Marunaj, but also thinking about the nation state, right? So thinking about how the nation state is being formed and particularly Costa Rica in its very much blancamiento and its very much narrative of mestizaje, one that's rooted in white supremacist notions of who belongs and doesn't belong. Um, there's something that, you know, I've been really captivated with finding La Negrita in a way that you really there's a time and space travel, right? We, we get to start in 19, you know, in 1635. I think that's a, an incredibly important moment to reckon with Costa Rican history. But you really take us on a journey with these um, these stories and these intimate portrayals. And I'd love to to kind of hear your the origin story, right? And I know that's like a big question, but right, 
Um, and I, you beautifully tell us on the first page, listen, I was meant to write this book, right? This book very much came out of my, my flesh and bone. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about the origin story, um, origin story to finding La Negrita. Okay, first, thank you so much to the forum for having me and supporting my voice, supporting my work. It is incredibly important. And Pablo, I thank you so much for bringing Mary into the space. She was a mentor and a devastating loss for all of us. I loved her dearly and I love her dearly, right? Love is an action verb and she is still an ancestor who clearly based on all this that's happening today, who clearly still paves the way. And so I think in many ways, the origin story is about ancestors, right? Um, and so I was born and raised in Brooklyn and my mom's Costa Rican, my dad's Panamanian. And I have always had a really interesting relationship, particularly with Costa Rica, because from very small, we would come to see my abuelita. And then, you know, Christmas was a big thing. We would come. I even had my quinceanera here in Costa Rica. And so I really had a relationship with the country. But one of the things that I noticed in San Jose, which is the capital, was that even when I was in these spaces with my family, we used to be the sort of the singular Black people walking in downtown San Jose. I mean, I remember, you know, walking in San Jose thinking like at 15, 16, you know, and crossing the street and people would be like, negra, morena, blah, 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 you know, in the street. And I didn't, um, so it felt very, um, sort of, it felt like a place that didn't embrace me, particularly because I didn't see many other people that looked like me beyond my large extended family. And then my work and my official training is really in, I'm an Africanist by trade um, and, and by training. And I really do work in, in slavery and in, in, in thinking about slavery and sort of the embodiment and acts of agency that enslaved people um, enacted in the process of surviving the slave moment, right? And we're still inside of the slave moment, at least that's my, we're, we're inside the legacy of it. And so I was really thinking about, you know, in terms of Costa Rica and, and my relationship here, I was thinking about the fact that Costa Rica really prides itself on being sort of the, the Switzerland of Central America, right? So it really has this which uh, somos ticos, we're ticos, everybody has sort of melted into the genetic de gene pool and everybody's sort of the hardworking Catholics um, and everybody's kind of the same, right? And even though everybody, of course, still um, performs some sort of uh, identity matching or marching towards Iberia, right? The, the Spanish motherland. And at the same time, so I understood that, but at the same time over here, I just thought it was an incredible idea that this country, which is over 85% Catholic, has a national day on August 2nd when the entire country shuts down in honor of the Black Madonna. And so I was like, how do, to, how do we put this together? A country that worships and venerates the patron saint of the Black Madonna, but a country that does not necessarily, in its, in its fabric of history and nation making, does not recognize the 200 plus years of slavery that it had, and especially the contributions of Afro descendants during that time period. So that sort of was the space. And then what happened was I got a really small grant to visit Costa Rica um, in January 2013. And I remember this specifically because this was the first time in my adult life where I actually came to Costa Rica. It was, you know, it wasn't Christmas holiday. It wasn't a birthday party. It wasn't, you know, anything special. It was basically everybody going to work. And my cousin said, you can stay with me. She gave me the keys and was like, that's the bus stop. And I was like, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do? You mean like I have to go to the, I have to go and try to figure out where the archives are in the library and mm -hmm. I did it I got on the bus right. and I managed it and it was the first time I remember sitting in a cafe across the street from the National Library and I just thought my god I love this place like I can do this thing right mm -hmm. it and I don't necessarily have to rely on mm -hmm. the family structures I mean my family structures are incredibly supportive but I didn't have to and in that trip I ended that trip by going to the Basilica, which is where the, mm. the icon of La Negrita is housed. And she is called now 
La Virgen de Los Angeles, the Virgin of the Angels, and she's she's the patron saint of, of Costa Rica, particularly um, for people who have petitions towards health, right? So she's in the Basilica in Cartago, which is the former colonial capital of Costa Rica. And when I went to the Basilica, I had this really transformative moment where I was at the altar and I had my eyes closed in meditation and I had a sense that the altar was filled with black people or circling or surrounding the energy surrounding this black Madonna. And in my mind's eye and in that moment, I was like, oh, okay, you're here because you want me to tell your story. And so what I said was, I will tell your story if you open the doors for me. And that was in January, 2013. And the, every single door, window, closet, <laughs> I mean, every okay. single okay. thing has opened and it's been an eight year journey, but here we are. And I did the job. I did the work that these ancestors wanted. And it's a really interesting story because one of the things that's particular about Costa Rica is that even though it had slavery for 200 years, it didn't have plantation slavery mm -hmm. when we think about other slave systems like mm -hmm. in Brazil or in the southern parts of the United States or the silver mines in South America. It mm -hmm. had a very um, had a very intimate type of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some of the things that I talk about as well as there was a free Afro-descendant population that lived on the outskirts of the colonial capital, which is really where I center my story on mm -hmm. the lives of free Afro-descendants, right? Because that's never part of the story when you think of the umbrella of slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. It, it, I had so many different questions around ancestors as a method, right? So thinking about ancestors as a form of methodology, I, I really, really appreciate, you know, the, the origin stories being about ancestors, right? And this kind of moment, this moment of you rediscovering Costa Rica on your own, right? Without the, the kind of preface of a family event or a gathering. There's also something incredibly important about this history of you know, in, in, in the book, it's referred to as El Pueblo de los Pardos, right? Uh, it's a free Black settlement. I think it really helps us to understand the multiplicity and the, and, and the nuances of the time period. But it also lets us think about Black, fugi uh, black fugitivity or marunage or freedom, right? And to a certain extent, um, in different ways in Costa Rica. And I wanted to particularly ask you a question around you know, the Black Madonna and the contradiction of the Black Madonna, right? So as Costa Rica imagines and self makes itself as, you know, the widest space in Central America, it has this rich and diverse Black history that is in many ways, right? And I think this is, this is the complexities and beauty of Black Central America, that it gets, um, you know, marked racialized and, and geographically racialized onto the Caribbean coast, right? Which really complicates black history on the Pacific side of things, right? And I think there's something really interesting in, in particularly the, the history of black Central America where the Caribbean is always this default space of blackness, right? As, as if it's infamable, like to, it's impossible to think of black people, you know, in Tegucigalpa, in Managua, in, you know, in San Jose, in the interior of the country. And in fact, if we look deeper into the archive, right, um, Black folks and Indigenous folks built those capital cities, right, those huge Pacific, right, so I think there's something really important that you're wrecking with here. I also think, so I want to ask a question around the Black Madonna and the contradictions of, of, mm -hmm. of Costa Rican national identity. I also want to think about ancestors as method. So thinking about how did you engage the historical archive? And I'd love to hear more on your thinking also on like, you know, Sadia Hartman's provocation, right? Of, of the death tomb of the black diaspora and, and what do we do with critical fabulation, right? How do we get into the interior lives that may not be traditionally archived, right? So how do we get those stories that are not necessarily always on paper? Because I, I definitely, there's a section in the book which I'm like, everyone go get this book where oral histories are incredibly important, right? Where oral histories 
are definitely one form of collecting this historical narrative. So I'd love, I know I, I, I'm like, I threw a lot, but I'm just like, wait, let, let's start with Black Madonna and, and the contradiction to Costa Rican nationalism, but also let's also keep the conversation with ancestors as methodology. Okay, perfect. So what's really interesting when you mention sort of the Caribbean coast, the Black Madonna is not on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. Not at all, which is really interesting because I think that in, in some ways, that's yes. what I wanted this kind of this book to do to sort of create a language that's a bridge, right? And so yes. In 1635, so the Catholic Church's in Costa Rica, like narrative, is 1635, there was a parda, and a parda is a, a free Black woman in Costa Rica, a peasant woman, who, um, who found the icon in the forest, took it home one day, put it in a box. The next day when she woke up, the icon was gone. She went back to the forest and the icon was back where she had found it originally. So she takes the icon a second time, takes it home, puts it in a box. Then third day she wakes up, the icon is not there in the box. She goes back to the forest, she finds the icon there. That third time she's actually quite frightened and she goes to the local priest and says, okay, I find the icon. The, um, the priest says, okay, um, and basically says, you know, this is uh, this is a like a special moment, an appearance, a blessing from the Holy Mother and baby, and we're going to build basically a structure um, that would eventually become sort of a, a church, right? And so this is sort of the the national narrative that Costa Rica has. What's really interesting is that originally in the archives it was this parda, this black woman who found the icon. Now, if you go to the basilica, the 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 young woman whose name is Juana Pereira is is a uh, indigenous girl. So she has been in many ways, she's been lightened, right? So we think about sort of this whitewashing process mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of national narratives. And then what's really interesting though, in the archive, so this is 1635 and Costa Rica doesn't gain its independence until 1821. And then slavery ends in Costa Rica officially in 1824. So we have mm. two, two, approximately 200 years. So what ends up happening is that the Catholic church decides, okay, this little icon, this negrita, this little black icon, cause it's, a, it's an icon that's quite small um, of a carving of, I mean, it literally it is, I don't know if you guys can see this, this is sort of a rendering of the icon. It's quite small, uh, not enslaved, um, to essentially take over the veneration of this black Madonna for about 200 years. But then what happens, and I always link it to sort of what the Afrikaners do in South Africa as they're trying to set up their national identity in South Africa during the apartheid regime, the, the Spanish, colonizers, right? When they gain independence, they need to now have some national symbol to, to essentially unify the country and create a national identity. And so what they do is they go into this Black community where the Black Madonna has been venerated with all forms of African ritual, right? So that's one of the complaints by the Catholic Church that they are, you know, that there's drumming and all sorts of African practices and rituals around the veneration of this Madonna for over 200 years. And then all of a sudden they take her out, they build this basilica, and essentially she now becomes this whitened version of La Virgen de Los Angeles. And now she is the patron saint of the nation. She symbolizes the Tico. Everybody is sort of absorbed into this bloodstream. Everybody's homogeneous. There are all these sort of Iberian Spanish leaning um, um, the Spanish leaning like desires, right? This whiteness. Um, and then that essentially that's what you have. So you have this particular contradiction. Now, mm -hmm. you also have very interestingly, right at the close of the 20th century in 1872, at the close of the 19th century, in 1872, you have the first boat on December 20th, 1872, you have the first boat of Jamaican, Bahamian, Barbadians who come over to the Caribbean coast to begin working on the, the railroad, right? And eventually um, you have the building of the railroad and then you have sort of the establishment of the port in Puerto Limon, which is on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. So when most Costa Ricans say, okay, where are the black people in Costa Rica? Everybody says Limon. Statistically today, 
No, most people of Afro-Caribbean origin are in the Central Valley, but there's not like one neighborhood that you can point to, right? However, Limon remains a very highly racialized sort of second-class space, even though 85% of all goods coming in and out of Costa Rica come from that port in, in Limon, and it is still considered a Black space. However, because you had former British uh, colonial subjects who spoke English, who were educated, who faced the Atlantic world, not the inner world of the Central Valley and the Spanish speaking world. Mm -hmm. These people were not Catholics. Right. And they're still not Catholics today. It mm -hmm. was the mestizos who were Catholic. And so these were people who had, you know, their own, they, most of them were bath, Baptist or Methodist. I mean, you even had Pocomania. You had, you had mm -hmm. many manifestations of different religious, Protestant religious practices that people took very seriously mm -hmm. in terms of res respectability politics. But they were not attached to La Negrita, La Virgen de los Angeles, or the Catholic sensibility whatsoever. It sort of attached itself to being Spanish, being Tico, being Mestizo, Central Valley, right? And so even mm -hmm. today, the, the people who are in Limon who are Catholic or who venerate the, la, um, la Negrita are people who are Mestizos, right? Who were yes. not originally Afro-Caribbean. And so I that's one of the things I thought about in this book. I was just like, I wonder if the people who the Afro-Caribbean people, which is where my family comes from in Costa mm -hmm. Rica, four generations mm -hmm. far, um, if they knew about the people of Afro descent mm -hmm. who had been enslaved and free during the mm -hmm. colonial period, if they had had that knowledge, mm -hmm. perhaps their time in thinking about their relationship with, with Limon and Costa Rica and identity building and na mm -hmm. and nationhood and national identity would have been very different because their their yes. troubles were very very strong um, as they worked for the United Fruit Company under Minor Cooper Keith, so that's the contradiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really appreciate that right that context in particular because even when I first got the copy of the book I was like. Who are you calling Negrita, right? Because in particular within, right? And this is definitely my Garifuna Brooklynite worldview, right? You know, Negrita, Negrito, Morenito, Moreno, they're not actually terms that Black folks in Black communities in Central America um, deeply embrace, right? In fact, I would, most of the time, right? Um, I'm, I'm called Negrito Morenito from a mestizo, right? right. So it, it was it, it was an interesting, because I think one thing about that historical narrative is that it also expands the Black diaspora in Costa Rica, right? It deeply, it deeply decenters Limon, right? As, right. This black, as this Black Mecca, but also says, hey, the Black diaspora was literally in every corner of this nation state that we call Costa Rica, right? Um, so I really appreciate that context because even the term Negrita, I was like, mm, what's this going to be about? What's this going to be about? And I was excited. Um, I was very excited to see that historical context because I don't think that historical context is always in conversation with each other, right? Not and I think all. there's not at all, right? And especially like, you know, you got even enough folks, we pride ourselves on like April 12th, 1797, right? And it's like, yep, there were definitely hundreds of years of Black folks here before got even enough folks arrived, right? So, you know, I, I'm always grateful for when these different time periods are in conversation with each other. Um, I do want to think a little bit more about the archive. There's something incredibly here. Because would you consider finding La Negrita? Like, I guess my question here is like, what's the genre? Like what in what genre? It's historical fiction. Say? It's absolutely historical fiction. Right. Okay. And so in thinking about in thinking about the archive, so um, as obviously I'm a trained scholar in doing research and that's sort of my, you know, my background, that's my training. And so originally I wanted to write uh, uh, more of a social science piece. I don't know if I was going to write a book, but I was very much in the archives. So I went to the British Library. I went to the National Archives in Costa Rica. I got access to um, church archives in Guatemala and the National Library here in Costa Rica. So mm -hmm. those are like four main archival sources that I worked in for at least five years. And so I was actually thinking about generating 
you know, uh, like a historical text um, where I was going to write about this history um, from a, a sort of a, a nonfiction point of view. And I realized like w one day I was in the, the National Archives of Costa Rica and I came across a listing of old Spanish colonial families in Cartago who listed all the enslaved people that they owned, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm absolutely confident that you know, many of those people still, you know, their family still mm -hmm. exists, that they are wealthy, mm -hmm. you know, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just thought, okay, well, here's the evidence in the archives. You know, I mean, of course, these enslaved people were listed alongside their horses and their cattle and all other kinds of properties that they had. And so for me, I just needed that sort of that physical evidence, the note taking that these, these people were actually here owned by these people. And by these Spaniards. And at that moment, once I had that confirmation, I then did the thing that felt instinctual to me, which was to create an inner world that was fiction in order to fill the gaps. So it is deeply steeped in absolute history, you know, the creating of Cartago, the marketplace, what foods were eaten, what the volcano looked like, the atmosphere, I mean, literally the, the, um, the different seasons, the climate, all these things are absolutely authentic to the space. I studied maps a lot. I love maps, actually, um, because it gives you a different flavor of just even how people walk through space, right? What the plaza looked like, what the church looked like. I went to Cartago several times. The church that I write about in the book is now a ruin, right? And it's a, a site that people go to, um, Santiago Apostal Church. And it's really beautiful. And there's this, there's this really interesting story, folklore from the church that is absolutely authentically replicated in the book because it is part of the folklore of Cartago from that time period that I basically have, have written into the fabric of the text. The characters are are people that just appeared. They're not based after any particular person. They are just characters that appeared and they appeared very strongly to me. There was no question about it. I knew their names from the beginning. I knew what they looked like and what they needed to say. Um, and there were four main characters that really really guided this, but I, but they were not, they were not composites of people. They were just their individual selves and they showed up for me. Um, and, and this book really just, even though fiction allowed me to think about relationships, it was really steeped in, and I wanted to show that particularly, the fact that Costa Rica's, uh, the, their form of, of slavery, particularly domestic slavery, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. people were enslaved in homes, even though you had this neighborhood where free African, African descended people lived and sort of had to negotiate freedom and work and all these kinds of things. I wanted to show that tension because that's essentially what was happening at the time period um, of, of the colonial moment in Costa Rica. Absolutely, right? And what you beautifully do is that you invite us into these intimate spaces and these intimate portrayals, and you really also disrupt plantation life, right? You give us a different, right, um, history on enslavement in the Americas. Before we turn it to the audience, I would love to invite you to read for us any, you know, any part that you would love to, to kind of introduce us to, to in Finding La Negrita. Okay. I, one of my favorite parts to read is actually the prologue. So if I could read the prologue, I'd be really, I just lend me your ear for a second. Yes, let's do it. Okay. <sighs> Fragrant, luxurious indigo blue. This is the color of night that engulfs Tuela as she enters Lupita's family compound near the center of town. The houses are lumpy shadows as the dark descends. The evening's twilight wraps around her like music. At 25, Tuela is poised in the beauty of her youth. Her mahogany skin accentuates her cheekbones and firmly set brown eyes. Though she leans more on the side of slender, her full lips have invited many to dream about their taste. It has almost been a year 
since she has seen her best friend and she is grateful for this trip with her father so she can visit with Lupita. Since she had married seven years ago and moved with Dakarai near the Zambezi, it is not often that her father plucks her from her sculpting work to accompany him on one of her lecturing trips, of his lecturing trips. But two weeks ago, her father appeared at their front door without ceremony and requested her presence with him at the palace in Benguela on the Angolan coast. He was being asked to interpret a new document that had come from northern Timbuktu. She was very familiar with the journey as she and Dakarai used the same roads on their annual market trip to sell their sculptures. Dakarai had seemed withdrawn when she told him that she would be away for two weeks. With a gentle embrace, she left him, ready to change the routine of her world and see Lupita. There was so much in her heart to share, things she could not tell her father. She had noticed his slower gait and even suggested they rest more often, but he remained determined to get there within the usual six days. And so now, with the evening air humid with ocean breeze from the coast and the expanse of sky a midnight blue with the orange rays of a sun no longer visible, Tuella enters the party. There is a fire to the left of the main house in the compound, and that is the source of all activity. Colorful cushions and blankets are strewn around the fire as the crowd of mostly young people sway to the melodic singing of a young man standing with his back towards her. Even from the compound wall's dung-colored entrance, Toella can see, because of the fire, that his dark skin is smooth like the rococo stone she uses to carve her Shona statues. Such a beauty. He is wreathed thin but passionate as his hands wave, enunciating the words he sings without accompaniment. Everyone is mesmerized. His words are in Kikongo, a language she cannot understand. But as she listens while she walks closer to the group, she gets the meaning of his words. They are a lament, perhaps, of things to come. His voice pierces the night and even the dogs settle into stillness. Tuella holds her breath. Closing her eyes, she gulps down the sounds, the pitch of his voice stinging the inside of her chest, and tears appear suddenly. She is startled when she feels arms around her, and it takes a second to realize that Lupita is embracing her. The joy she feels at being held by her friend brings the tears faster, and as she rests her head on Lupita's soft round shoulder, her body shakes with sobs. Lupita simply holds her, per perhaps assuming that she is moved by the music as much as the rest of the crowd. They release each other when the song comes to an end, joining the group of around 25 people, mostly in their 20s, in a rousing applause. Come, let's go sit away from everyone so you can fill me in on life. I have missed you so much, Tuella, Lupita says, as she grabs Tuella's hand and leads her towards the main house. The nearly full moon allows for some light in the darkness as they move away from the fire. In the distance, Tuella can hear that the singer had been convinced to sing a local favorite tune, and other voices eagerly join in once he begins to sing again. Tuella and Lupita enter a small house, round in shape with a thatch cone roof that has an opening in the center for smoke. There is a fire in the middle of the room that brings warmth to the three sleeping children on wooden beds. This is where Lupita lives with her mother and three smaller siblings. Her father resides in the main house, and both he and her mother are gone to visit the palace for the presentation by Tuella's father. Tuella knew the feast afterward would extend for hours, and this was why she had asked permission to visit with Lupita, who remained in the compound to care for her younger brothers and sister. Lupita is a small wonder. At 24, Lupita is chocolate brown, short and round, with full hips, plump breasts, and a perpetual blush from the beach's constant sun tinging her cheeks and a ready twinkle in her eye. Her hair is always plaited in the newest styles and bejeweled with shells. 
She is the object of desire for most young men in the village, but her father's wealthy status in the community leaves most of them pining from afar. Allowed great freedom to invite local friends to share their art at the family compound, Lupita has become known as a great hostess and the center of the cultural scene in Benguela. Once settled in the darkened space, Tuella quietly fills her friend in on her life with Dakarai. She tells about the seven years of waiting to become a mother and the despair and sadness she feels. Then she is silent. Unburdening her heart has been helpful. Lupita holds her hand and just listens. As she is going to speak, Lupita is suddenly called from outside. Getting up, she indicates to Tuella that she should remain seated while she sorts out what is happening outside. Tuella barely has time to close her eyes when Lupita comes back in, grabbing her hand to pull her upright in excitement. Tuella, it's the poet, the famous Agostino. Someone invited him here and oh, I cannot believe that he actually came. This is a real honor. Lupita almost shouts, forgetting her sleeping siblings. Tuella cannot say much before she is dragged outside towards the fire. She can already sense the anticipation in the air as Augustino clears his throat. What she does not expect is to have the breath knocked out of her when she faces him across the fire. He looks nothing like a poet, who in her mind's eye should be languid, short, and intense. Cinnamon brown with short, thick hair and broad shoulders, he stands a little under six feet tall. Augustino looks more like a prince than a wandering wordsmith. They lock eyes and he smiles with just the left side of his lips curving up to acknowledge her blush. Looking down at her feet, Tuella does not pay much attention as he begins to recite a poem in Portuguese, which causes an instant uproar amongst the crowd as they protest the use of the white man's tongue. Hushing the crowd to listen carefully, Augustino starts again, skillfully intertwining Kikongo with Portuguese in a political poem, condemning the increased slave trade that is happening on their shores and in the marketplace just outside of Lupita's family compound. Soon, his words are heralded as several young men spring to their feet with a rapturous applause. When the night grows late and the crowd begins to fade, Tuela holds back. On the arrival of Lupita's parents, all those lingering say their quick goodbye. Tuella gets special greetings as they love her deeply. They embrace her with the warmth and exhaustion of enjoying a long evening out. They immediately retire after giving instructions to the servants to put out the fire. After a few more poems by Augustino, Lupita had finally introduced him to Tuella. She finds that he is Mubonda and also 25. He now lingers at the compound entrance as Tuella gives Lupita a final hug. Without words, she walks alongside Augustino as they take the central road into town. In their quiet conversation about nothing and everything, Augustino switches into Tumbuka, which he speaks, and explains that he is a teacher in his village. As they walk side by side, they occasionally touch hands. At the intersection of the road that leads towards his lodgings, Augustino looks at Tuella. With his right hand, he reaches out to touch her lips. Their eyes had long adjusted to the darkness, and she gently gives a soft nod of consent and follows him to his place, which is not far away and easy to get to in the flickering moonlight. Tuella's heart races as she wants this moment outside of time. She thinks only fleetingly of Dakarai when they enter Augustino's room and he turns to kiss her. They make love quickly, no sounds, only breathing and then respite as if starved. She holds on to him when he climaxes inside of her as she has little fear of pregnancy since it has not happened in seven years of marriage. When he softened, he gently removes himself from her, kisses her shoulders, and settles into sleep. She watches him as he snores, noticing the hairs of his short beard move. For some reason, this makes her giggle. She thinks of Dakarai's clean face, and this is when she remembers who she is. She quietly dresses in the encroaching dawn light and makes it back to her own lodgings without another to serve as witness.
She washes up quickly in cold water, traces of the sun already peaking in the rose pink sky. Grateful that she has a room separate from her father's, she crawls into bed. The sleep that overtakes her is the most peaceful she's had in months. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Snap, snap, snap. Love and light. Thank you so much for bringing, bringing us into these stories, into these narratives, into this history. Um, I'm ex incredibly excited to hear the Q&A. Uh, would love to open it up to audience. Uh, please feel free to go ahead and uh, throw your questions in the chat. Um, and also please, um, Hoso is going to be sharing with us links around ordering the book. They're available on Barnes and Nobles as well as Barnes and Nobles and well Amazon. As Amazon, <laughs> thank you, Amazon. We got to get that link in the chat as well. But um, please, definitely, um, if anyone has a question, throw it in. I'm really captivated by this narrative, and I'm I'm ex so excited that finally La Negrita is out in the world, which I'm thrilled to be teaching next semester in Black Latin America. So thank you for this, right? Like I literally have been dying for this type of, you know, scholarship to give to students, right? Because I think this is such um, such an intimate portrayal and that we don't really, we rarely get to have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm ready for questions if anybody wants to jump on. And if you don't type it in the chat, you can also just come off mute. And, and 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 we can uh, answer questions like that. I saw someone come off mute. You're more than willing and able to come off mute if you can. Yeah. Uh, thank you for those who joined us a little bit uh, uh, as we started. We're excited to be hosting Natasha Gordon-Chipembere for this conversation led by Pablo Jose Lopez Oro. So please feel free to come off mute. I saw someone come off mute. You can come off mute or you can just write a question in the chat. If not, our good Pablo will have, he has other questions. So I'm sure that there are other guys. So while we wait for folks to to I see a hand up. up, there we go. Let's take that hand. Shadi, I think it's Shadi. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering about the portion where you were talking about what um, the people of that time, like the ancestors, would do differently if they knew the context of when you were saying that how now it's mostly like mestizo people who um, are venerating the Black Madonna in that area. And I think you mentioned something, I kind of missed it. You mentioned something about what they would do differently knowing like the trajectory of history um, based on like when they were working for the fruit companies, um, mm -hmm. if they knew, um, I guess, like the trajectory of history, what they would do differently. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Maybe I just missed it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was always thinking about that. And I think that's one of the things that I wanted people um, in Costa Rica and just broader to think about these multiple waves of people of African descent in Costa Rica. But I guess, um, so one of the things that happened was with the United Fruit Company and the, um, the arrangements through the, with Minor Cooper Keith, who built the railroad from the Central Valley into um, the Puerto Limon, the, the Caribbean coast, um, there were deeply racialized sentiments and, and some laws that were implemented by the Mestizo government in the Central Valley that really prohibited Black movement, right? And so it was very much sort of these foreigners, we want to keep them kind of contained to the Caribbean coast with um, the idea of perhaps eventually they will return back home. And what happened was the United Fruit Company could not pay these workers that they had brought over in the thousands after they built the railroad, built the port, built Puerto Limon, the city, and essentially established banana 
plantations, you know, through uh, alongside this entire railroad line. And so what they did was they paid them in land. And so what ends up happening is this first wave of Afro-Caribbean people, they basically, you know, have this idea, I'm going to work here for seven years, going to make some money, I'm going to go back to Jamaica, you know, build a house and, you know, whatever, build in my community. So there was a very much, I'm here and I'm out. Um, but then when the payment came through land, people began to cultivate the land. And then what happened? They started to have family. So a second generation um, and then a third generation. By the time the third generation is here in Costa Rica, there is no longer the sentiment of this, of this nostalgic Jamaica. Right. That's from the great, great, the great grandparent who's now talking about this nostalgic Jamaica or grandmother who's talking about that everybody else is by this point it's 1948 and there's a civil war in Costa Rica and under the president Figueres, essentially he's like, OK, well, you know, we're going to have to absorb these people. Right. Because they've been here for at least three generations already. So what do we do with them? And so Afro uh, Afro-Caribbean people essentially made the transition into becoming Ticos or Afro Costa Ricans um, in 1948 they had to apply for naturalization. Even though their mothers and grandmothers had been born in the country, they essentially still had to apply for citizenship. And what that meant is once they became citizens, um, there were certain trade-offs, including the fact that the national government said everybody has to go to Spanish school. Because at that time in Puerto Limón, you had a whole community of English speakers and the, and also Limon, Limon, they also spoke Limonense Creole and they brought their teachers, their English speaking teachers, right? So they spoke the Queen's English because Jamaica was a former British colony. Um, they brought them from Jamaica to educate their children. And so even in thinking about my mother where she went to English school and then she went to Spanish school and that was sort of the realities that you had a lot of these Afro-Caribbean children sort of on this line of multiple identities and then I think after the third generation, people were just like, okay, we're absorbing this Tico identity. We, this is the nation, this is our home. There is not a Jamaica, you know, it's, it's nostalgic, right? It's what my grandparents talk about, but essentially I want to move forward in part of my Costa Rican identity because this is my home. So I think that my question is, um, or my question was sort of in trying to answer that, if those, first, second, third generations of people who felt that or understood that they were not welcome into the Central Valley, right, because there was sort of a policy of Black containment, if they had already known that people of African descent had basically built the colonial capital, had already been in the Central Valley for so many years, for hundreds of years, and they had already had an established presence, perhaps there they would have understood the land differently and felt a different type of right as a person of African descent to be in any space in the country and it and um, sort of claim those spaces rather than sort of sit inside of the exclusionary and racialized practices that the central government was sort of forcing them into this very confined space. So I was just thinking about land and mobility and thinking about history and how people claim space. Hopefully that answers the question. So thank you so much. We have a question. Okay, thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Yes, it's perfect. The second question is, how does this book talk about Black love and resistance? And I know, I know you don't want to give it all away, but you know, there's that prologue gave us some insight. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm really happy for that question because I think if there's anything that you can take away from this book or thinking about like the, a theme that defines it, the theme for me is love, love in all its manifestations, right? So it is the love of self, right? Um, the familial love, love between a father and a daughter who really, you know, they really care about each other in ways that are so beautiful and very, very fragile. Um, romantic, intimate loves, uh, you know, um, what we heard a little bit of Tuela and Augustino, right? Um, forbidden love, right? Um, and then love of community. But I think there's also the love of freedom. And when there's the love of freedom, what happens is people have to make choices because of that love and that desire to remain free or to become free, right? And so that is another type of love that happens. Um, 
in the book. And so for me, it is very much centered on uh, sort of entering the, the, the intimacies of characters of African descent, Black folks in all, you know, all iterations, whether they are enslaved or free, they're old, they're disabled, whatever it is, coming of age, a teenager, and how they, um, how they live their lives, how their lives are embodied. So they're not statistics. They are not um, people who, you know, are in a chart. They are more than the archive, right? So they're not numbers and statistics and property. These are people who live and cry and love and are full. And I want to say um, I am deeply inspired or I was deeply inspired years ago by Edrich Dandy Katz's writing of The Farming of Bones. And I don't know if you, I mean, it's, it, this is a book that has been in existence for at least 15 years. And it is a historical fiction rendering of the 1937 massacre, um, the Parsley Massacre or the massacre of Haitian cane workers over a week in the Dominican Republic. And for me, one of the things that I, I, I encountered for the first time was that she was able to present Black love as radical, revolutionary, as intimate, as fragile, as beautiful, as peaceful, as a bomb. Um, in the face of absolute terror and oppression, which is essentially something that I think surrounds Black life in general around the globe, right? So it can't just always be these stories of, of terror and sadness and broken bodies. And those things happen. Those are definitely part of the reality of this genocide that has happened on the back of Black people, of African descended people, but there's also beauty and love and intimacy and laughter. And those things have to be brought up front. We don't always have to narrate um, the suffering because we, we manage the suffering, but we also manage the love and beauty and luxury and power. And why can't we have that as well? We can have nice things. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to show love because I'm also someone, and I have to say, I am very loved. I live in a world where people love me and support me, you know, and I wanted to reflect that reality. It's not something that I'm pulling from my armpit because I'm dreaming it up. It's sentiment that I have felt, I have felt and lived. And so that's that's what's authentic to the text. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. I cannot, cannot enough express so much deep gratitude and appreciation for the work you have have been doing for years, right? And, and this is such a labor of love and life. And thank you so much for Thank you, just so much thank you. Thank you, thank you. And please everyone go get you a copy of Fanny La Negrita. Um, please join me in giving Natasha a lot of love, light, all of the Zoom good vibes, buena vibras, love and light. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Josue, who's going to finish us up for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you all. It's so exciting. We had a little bit of some tech issues that we had, but we were thankful for everyone for joining today. Uh, we do have one more question that I think you can address. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then I'll close this out. But I think I thought this question was good. Not that there are bad questions, but I thought this question might be interesting. Uh, based on your research, could you say more about what everyday Black life might have been like in colonial and post-independence Cartago? Were you able to find records in legal and or other discourses documenting the lives of Black people in Costa Rica? I'm thinking of the work of Chile in Costa Rica and writer Tatiana Lobo about colonial Costa Rica. Okay, um, so I think that everyday Costa Rican life in, Car in Cartago, I think it was really, um, it was labor intensive, right? And that's for everyone. So we have to understand that Costa Rica was considered sort of a backwater, like third cousin removed kind of um, outposts to the, the, the Spanish crown because they didn't have a cash crop, okay? So they had cacao, right, for 
um, as a potential crop for about 50 or 60 years, but in actuality, they could not compete with sugar from Brazil or these big cash like monocrop plantation systems in other parts of the world. And a lot of the terrain was just very difficult to traverse. And so I think everyday life, so there were three main usages, I think, for enslaved people in colonial Cartago. You had um, the enslaved people who were sent more to the Caribbean coast of Matina to, to work on the cacao plantations. You then had cattle ranchers, right? So there's a whole population of, of, of cattle ranchers and cowboys of Afro descent here in Costa Rica, but in the Northwest and more of the, the Guanacaste area. And then the large largest majority, and of course, these were women primarily. So this is where you see the rapid sort of mixing, right, of, of from enslaved women and their owners and these children that are produced, um, but you have them in the home, right? And so what was very interesting, I think, is that the Spaniards were not super wealthy. There were a couple that sort of had places of prominence and did have some money, but for the most part, the Spaniards that were there literally had to work alongside their enslaved people. And so what ends up happening is a lot of these Spanish um, colonizers cannot, um, cannot afford to keep enslaved people. So that's why you have a free black population because at some point, many of them were enslaved, but then their, their owners had to give them up because they could not financially support them. And so what you have is a different kind of sort of game that happens, right? With someone who is a black person who's free with uh, potentially their even former owner now who has to negotiate work and compensation in different ways. And I tried to capture that particular tension in the book as well, you know, always talking about sort of the fragility, that line between being free and enslaved and what it meant for Black people and how it could be really tricky and you had to navigate these worlds so intimately. And I think that's what really defines sort of the everyday world in Colonial Cartago is, um, the nature of the games that people had to negotiate all the time, lots of negotiations, it, because it was so intimate. People lived in their houses, right? They raised their children, you know, and there wasn't necessarily uh, a plantation system where there were like slave quarters or there were field workers. This was a, a city space. So people just lived in their homes and engaged with their owners that way. Hopefully that answers the question. I thought there was one more question as well. I saw something else come up, but I don't know, Josue. Yeah, I think we can ask that questions for both of you with Pablo's history as an educator uh, in many different levels, but he definitely for sure in the K through 12 classroom. Natasha, the question is, how might you suggest using this text in the classroom? Natasha, you know, you and I spoke about this earlier when we had a, a Pablo, Pablo about it as well. How do you say, and what space can love have in our review of history as we decentralize history from white supremacist methodologies. Oh, okay. So in terms of the text, you know, someone has asked me this already. This is, I would say from grade 10, probably because there is sexual assault in the text. Um, it is not incredibly graphic, um, but there is sexual assault. And so I always give that warning, but I think that if there's enough context, um, certainly from 10th grade on, it probably could be, it could, probably could be taught, certainly in a university setting. Um, and you, I would teach it um, a lot, sort of in, I guess a space of looking at history, thinking about Costa Rica, thinking about sort of the African diaspora, thinking about slavery, um, thinking about identity formation, colonial times. I mean, there are lots of different ways I think the text can be taught. Um, and then thinking about the question about love, it could also be taught as, okay, what are sort of radical place markers in thinking about slavery? right? And what are some forms of agency that people performed? And obviously, for me, I think the most radical form of agency protest in, against enslavement is, is love, right? So whether you're loving yourself or loving, you know, or taking the risk of loving someone else, right? Particularly maybe someone who's enslaved or to enslave people together. Um, that is a major risk because obviously you don't own your person. And so um, that is a major risk, I think, that is, that could be taught in that way as well. 
think you probably yeah. do you want to share something. Yeah, go ahead, Pablo. Yeah. So just really quickly, I mean, I think one one particular thing about the text is that it's incredibly accessible to undergrads. I think it's a text that I would even teach at the high school level, um, particularly because I think it really because of the genre of historical fiction, it gives us the raw materiality of history while giving us the intimate portrayals of individual stories, right? And stories of communities, right? And I think it's incredibly important as we, you know, this, uh, for me, the, it, this text, Finding La Negrita, really taps in to a larger Black feminist genealogy of critical fabulation, right? So like Sadia Hartman, you know, thinking about the work of Sarah Haley, like thinking about the work that uh, Black women have been doing to, to restore, recover, uh, black diasporic history, and I, it, it's it's a it's a text that I'm eager to teach because I think students can really gravitate to the narratives and can, and it really situates us right. It really, I mean, you you open up the page. It's 1635 Costa Rica, right? It, we're really sitting in this archive, right? Um, so I'm I'm excited to teach it, and I think there's a lot of possibility here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Let's give it one more time. Let's give it up to Pablo. Give it up for Pablo and for Natasha for this wonderful book. We thank you both so much. Thank you all for attending and joining us in our event. Um, uh, we, we are really excited. We're going to send the recording. You know, we've gotten some emails from some people that wanted to attend, but weren't able to attend. Um, uh, there's like a big storm happening in New York City right now. I'm not in New York, but where I'm at, though, so you can see the power we're now, <laughs> but the Wi-Fi is still on, so I'm thankful for that. I'm wow. thankful not to miss the event. So we're really glad about this event. We have another uh, event coming up in a month, another event celebrating a book where we're actually starting a partnership with Cafe Con Libros. Cafe Con Libros is an Afro-Latinx Black feminist bookstore here in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm not in Brooklyn, but usually I am in Brooklyn. Uh, if, if the forum can share that slide deck. And we have a, a presentation uh, a book, another book celebration coming up. Um, Give me one second. Uh, we have another book celebration coming up. Um, us, uh, talking about The Pain We Carry by Natalie Gutierrez. There's a conversation that you can join, um, that you can join uh, with Tasha Hunter. The link is, uh, we'll put the link in the chat. It's uh, crowdcast.io slash E slash pain we carry. Also, you can find it at Cafe Con Libros and you can find it on our website at AfroLatinoForum.org. And we'll have that information up soon. And we hope that you can continue to join us for other, other events coming up. Please follow us on Instagram, on Twitter at Afro Latino Forum, on Facebook, our page is Afro Latino Forum, and our website is AfroLatinoForum.org or AfroLatinaForum.org or AfroLatinexForum.org, AfroLatinexForum.org. All of those URLs um, can be that. So thank you everyone so much. Thank you again, Natasha and Pablo, and thank you all for joining. We hope to see you again in the near future. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.